प्रसाद स्कल्पचर वाला कॉल कर रहे पागल है सर सर एक मीटिंग में हूं मैं आप मेरे को गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन सर गुड आफ्टरनून प्रोफेसर तलवार अभिषेक गुड आफ्टरनून तलवार सर गुड आफ्टरनून सुबीर सर सुन पा रहे हैं आप प्रोफेसर तलवार अभिषेक गुड आफ्टरनून गुड आफ्टरनून सर साउंड आ रहा है प्रोफेसर तलवार रेंट पे ये फर्स्ट अप्रैल से अवेलेबल है सर अभी सुनाई आ रहा है आपको एटलीस्ट फिफ्टी फाइव थाउजेंड पर मंथ इट्स ए थ्री बेडरूम अपार्टमेंट फिफ्टीन जीरो टू इन टावर सिक्स गुड आफ्टरनून जी क्या मेरा लाइफ क्या कहा जी हाँ जी
सर आप सुन पा रहे हैं डॉक्टर तलवार आप सुन पा रहे हैं सर आपकी आवाज तो आ गई हमें नमस्कार नमस्कार सर डॉक्टर श्रीवास्तव आपका एनुअल लेक्चर है हाँ सर जरूर 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 सर बहुत अच्छा लगा रिकॉल माई विजिट टू यू नाइस टू सी यू नाइस विजिट आफ्टर सच ए लॉन्ग टाइम वेल आई मीन टाइम फ्लाइस यस सर नमस्कार जी स्पीकर कहा सर आएंगे चार बजे ना तुमने तो पौने चार कहा था पौने चार सर कनेक्ट होने के लिए कहा था अभी मुझे क्या पता आप तो अभी भी इतना स्मार्ट है कि तुरंत कनेक्ट कभी कभी टाइम लग जाता है कैसे तुम्हारी मर्जी हो टॉक यस यस सर ज्वाइन एट सर कुछ और चीज कर ले तब तक कि अभी ऐसे चलते जाए सर जैसा आपको ठीक तो कराओ ना बीच में लोग तो लोग तो आपको देखकर खुश होते हैं सर तो और लोग ज्वाइन करेंगे सर आफ्टर सीइंग यू मेनी पीपल विल लिंक आपको देख के तो वो बिल तो अचरज में पड़ जाएंगे कि सर ने पहले ही ज्वाइन कर लिया सबसे डॉक्टर रडन्ना साहब गुड इवनिंग श्रीवास्तव गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग आपने वक्त दिया था मेंबर ऑफ दिस सिलेक्शन बोर्ड ऑफ एनिमल साइंस ग्रुप ओह ओके 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 ऑल दिस ब्रदर ग्रुप सो यू आर सेटल्ड इन हैदराबाद ओनली या या आई एम स्टिल इन द कंटिन्यूइंग इन द यूनिवर्सिटी राइट राइट सो एडजेसेंट टू एनआईएबी सो यू विल कंटिन्यू योर ओल्ड एसोसिएशन विद इन शी या 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 लेट्स ऑलवेज बेटर हम्म Have you visited after the inauguration of the no, facility? Sir, I, 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 I did not. I could not be. Subir should invite you. No, oh, I, I will. I will certainly. I have yeah. also asked Dr. Subir. Let make some opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <coughs> you you made the uh, uh, road smooth for uh, Subir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so, <laughs> so we, <laughs> thank you note should come <laughs> from the director so dear is wonderful person yeah नित्या कैन यू हियर मी नित्या वाधवा यस सर आई कैन हाँ नित्या कैन यू डू मी ए फेवर आई सेंड जूम लिंक टू डॉक्टर प्रमोद गर्ग फॉर हिज पर्सनल पार्टिसिपेशन आई थिंक बाय मिस्टेक सर्कुलेटेड ओके ओके कैन यू आस्क ऑल ऑफ देम टू ज्वाइन थ्रू यू ट्यूब रुचि यू डोट डिस्कनेक्ट नाउ यू स्टे देर सो दैट यू कैन सी अदर्स एंड कीप कॉलिंग देम एंड गो टू यू ट्यूब एट द एंड यू डिस्कनेक्ट ओके थैंक यू आई डू दैट थैंक यू कॉल देम टू कनेक्ट एट यू ट्यूब थैंक यू सो मीटिंग विल बी स्टार्टिंग दिस इज प्रभात फ्रॉम नेशनल ब्रेन रिसर्च सेंटर सो इट विल बी स्टार्टिंग एट फोर ओ क्लॉक ओके ओके 
I can't hear your video is mute. I think. I think sir has joined, but it will start at four o'clock. Okay, no problem. So when the meeting starts, I think at that time everybody will be muted by the organizer. But if you want to ask any question at the end, if you click to the participant somewhere at the bottom, it is written as participant. Then on right hand down, you will uh, find raise hand. So if you raise hand, then organizer will allow you to ask us. Hi, BP. हाँ समझा सर अन्य निम्न इसलिए Hi, Sindhura, how are you? Very good, as a bit. Ah, good, good, good. Nice to see you. Very nice to see you. Yeah, it must be what, 2 a.m., around 1.45, 2 a.m.? Yes, <coughs> and that's why my video is off. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, good, good. I just woke up. Hey, so, you, you look great, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Subir, Vijay here. Um, Hi, sir. How are you, sir? Very good. Um, will you let me share my screen sometime? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, when uh, when I introduce after that, sir? Okay, what? no problem. I'll just join in a second. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see everybody. Good to see Dr. Talwar in particular. Professor, Tal Professor Talwar, you can unmute, kar lije, sir. हाँ सर अभी आप बोल सकते हैं अभी ठीक है हाँ सर डॉक्टर विजय राघवन आपको हेलो कह रहे हैं हाँ तो मैंने मैंने रिप्लाई किया जी बिल्कुल सर आपका चेहरा भी थोड़ा ऊपर उठाना है कंप्यूटर को थोड़ा एडजस्ट करना है हाँ बढ़िया मैंने जान बुझ के इसलिए सर कुछ लोगों को जूम में रखा है सो दैट वी सी इच अदर रेस्ट ऑफ मोर पीपल आर ऑन यूट्यूब ओके ओके बट वी थॉट वील डू दिस सो दैट वी आई रिकॉल माय कमिंग टू योर इंस्टिट्यूट यस सर यस सर यस सर ओपनिंग लेक्चर्स यस सर वाज ए नाइस हाउ इज़ द लेक 
sir good lake and we have developed a very good garden there so professor gangli came so we put a sofa set and chair there he had samosa and tea at 5 pm are he enjoyed wonderful abhi sir aayenge professor vijay raghavan ko aana ek baar aaj rul so dr vijay raghavan we were supposed to lay the foundation stone on that day that that got cancelled yes <laughs> since then i think you have not visited an ab any time no i i will come again soon no sir the the hostel inauguration i have kept pending unless you come that have been inaugurated it has come up really well very yes. well wonderful and wonderful to see the auditorium yes. and people there ha yeah. sir ये दो लेक्चर अलग अलग लेक्चर हॉल्स थे सर ये दोनों मैंने बीच में से वाल तोड़वा के ऑडिटोरियम बना दिया मैंने कहा एक ही बार गवर्नमेंट देती है बाद में तो नहीं बनेगा सो वी कैन वी कैन स्टार्ट रेस्ट ऑफ दीपुल विल ज्वाइन ऑन यूट्यूब गुड आफ्टरनून डॉक्टर आर के सिंह सो we will we will uh, mute everyone once the uh, lecture starts and i i i would it's it's almost 4 o'clock so we can start sir must be very busy so i welcome all of you to begin with and this occasion we all know that this is for our very dear dr lalji singh abhishek singh whom you can see here is a uh, son of dr lalji singh who is participating today dr lalji singh was a great human being always smiling quiet and very focused that's how we have seen him at niab an excellent scientist who worked in the field of dna fingerprinting technology he was popularly known as the father of indian dna fingerprinting Dr Lalji also worked in the areas of molecular basis of sex determination wildlife conservation forensics and evolution and migration of humans in 2004 he received the padma shri in recognition of his contribution to indian science and technology dr lalji was the first chairman of scientific advisory committee of niab till his untimely demise his presence was so pleasant that no scientist ever felt stressed about our scientific advisory committee meetings he was a visionary and helped nib to grow he was a renowned scientist and held prestigious positions like director of ccmb hyderabad vice chancellor of bhu banaras hindu university also he was instrumental in creating two premier institutes in this country center for dna fingerprint and diagnostics cdfd hyderabad and a unique program of wildlife conservation by setting up the laboratory of conservation of endangered species lacons under umbrella of ccmb hyderabad his own research work revealed the structure of indian genome variation in different ethnic groups migration of human population including that of andaman and nicobar in 2004 dr singh founded a non profit research and service organization the genome foundation with the aim of diagnosing and treating genetic disorders affecting the indian population in particular the underprivileged people residing in rural area with the participation and voluntary service of scientists and professionals this morning we went to his house to offer bouquet of flower to his wife his son abhishek who is here helped her mother to realize the occasion as she suffers from alzheimer's disease we felt very good and very satisfied abhishek is here with us and he would like to share few words maybe a minute or two so uh, with the permission of uh, everyone i would request him to speak for a minute or two thank you sir am i audible yes you are yes, you are okay. so namaste everyone uh, the family is extremely pleased and grateful to see our late father dr lalji singh been ordered through this first memorial lecture graced by such eminent persons shri professor vijay raghavan and professor pilwar sahab we would also like to thank niab and professor subir majumdar for organizing this it's been just under 4 years our family in this great nation lost the legend of lalji singh under such tragic circumstances due to negligence for which the family still does not have closure so even till today it is in a very it is a very emotional 
moment for all of us. However, his legacy and contributions to science and the nation live on. He was a very humble personality with deep connections to the grassroots, and he had a very strong desire to take the benefits of science to the masses. May his departed soul rest in peace. Thank you, sirs, for honoring my father. Thank you so much, Abhishek, and our good wishes to your family, as thank always, you. forever. And I thank you for joining. Uh, uh, whenever you have some work, as you said, you can leave in between. But thanks for coming and joining us. Uh, we are thankful to the governing body of NIAB who helped us instituting this lecture to be delivered by a prominent figure every year in honor of Dr. Lalji Singh. For the first lecture, we have chosen Professor Vijay Raghavan. My joy has no bound today as we could get Professor Vijay Raghavan amongst us for this noble occasion at NIAB. Dr. Renu Sorup, Secretary DBT, is busy with parliamentary committee meeting, and but she has conveyed her thanks and regards to Professor Vijay Raghavan. Professor Vijay Raghavan is a distinguished professor and former director of National Center for Biological Sciences. Sir, I will not speak more than one minute. Let's limit. <laughs> Before you stop me. And was secretary DBT and currently serves as principal scientific advisor to government of India. His research interests encompass developmental genetics and neurogenetics. He is the alumni of IIT Kanpur, TIFR Mumbai, and Caltech USA. Amongst Numerous accolades, Dr. Vijay Raghavan is an elected fellow of the Royal Society, Foreign Associates of Foreign Associate of US National Academy of Science, Fellow of the Third World Academy of Sciences, and recipient of Dr. Shanti Shuru Bhatnagar Prize, and was conferred upon the Padma Shri in 2013 by Government of India. Today, Niab is doing extremely good work in the field of livestock genomics, which he entrusted us to carry on long ago with his vision. And we are proud, sir, within three to four months, we'll be releasing the first chip, which we have made, and I will detail you later on. I thank you once again, sir, and wish you everything good for now and coming times, and invite you, sir, for the first Professor Lalji Singh Memorial Lecture of Niab, sir. Thank you very much, Subir. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here, and particularly to be here in memory of my late friend, Dr. Lalji Singh. Um, Dr. Lalji Singh, you've already said what an amazing person uh, he was, uh, and he really uh, had an enormous and disproportionate impact on the Indian biology scene. Uh, Subir, if I may share my screen, is that okay? Uh, Huh. You can share it? Yeah, I'm just trying to find out where. It must be green color down. Yeah, but you. I think you need to say that multiple users can share. Have you said that? Okay, okay I think I'll, I'll, they will do. My, my team is sitting at auditorium, sir, they will do. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think I know what's happening. Can you share now, sir? Yeah, yeah, I have to go and allow Zoom to share the screen. I'm trying to do that. It'll just take me a second. OK. 
Okay, I have to um, quit and rejoin. It'll take me a second. Yes, sir. Okay. Good. Uh, can you see the screen now, uh, Sabir? Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's fine. Wonderful. Excellent. Good. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. And, you know, it's also a sad occasion. Lalji Singh died uh, too suddenly and too early. Uh, he had a lot more to contribute, but uh, as I said, his contributions are immense and, you know, we must remember this wonderful person. And I really like this picture of his uh, holding a rock python. It sort of captures many aspects of what he did. His setting up lacones, his looking at snake repeat sequences, the crate, not this snake, and using that for DNA fingerprinting, uh, and also his interest in transforming that into helping set up uh, DNA fingerprinting into applications in India, uh, like setting up the CDFD, but also uh, looking at um, sequences from the human context. Now, what I will talk today is about bridging the genotype phenotype gap. Uh, I'm now going to go into slide view mode and tell me if you can still see my slide. You can see it now? Good. Okay. Now, the challenge in biology today is about how we can bridge the enormous gap in our ability on one side to collect data at every level, genetic sequence, RNA sequence, uh, you know, mass spectrometry, imaging data, and so on, and connect that ultimately to cellular and organismal phenotype. Now, this is an enormous problem because if you go to any laboratory in the country and indeed anywhere in the world, uh, what you find is people extremely busy collecting data. Uh, and this huge volume of data allows multiple kinds of interpretations because many interpretations are consistent with the data, but the challenge is which is the correct interpretation, which is biologically, uh, and physiologically in every way uh, consistent or correct with the data. That is the big challenge we have. Uh, now here is uh, a set of pictures of ants, army ants of exactly the same genotype. Uh, they range in size from less than about a millimeter or so, the smallest, to the largest about several tens uh, uh, more than uh, uh, 10 millimeters, about 12 millimeters or so. How do you get with the exact same genotype such a wide range of phenotypes? And that's also illustrated uh, in this picture where the queen, the queen ant uh, with the same genotype as one of the workers and the worker is standing on the head of the queen. Now, this is the big challenge. If you go into this ant's DNA, you will find the DNA of these two ants identical. Then you will sequence <clears throat> the RNA during development. You will find different RNAs are transcribed at different times, and you'll come up with various hypotheses. You will need to integrate what the ant is eating and you know, how it lives and so on. And you will try to decipher why there is this enormous difference in phenotype with the same genotype. <clears throat> this difference in genotype, this, this need to bridge the genotype and phenotype is also seen in social behavior on a huge scale. Um, you have on the left a termite hill 
on the campus of the Agricultural University in Bangalore. And on the right is a, the spires of a church in Barcelona uh, done by the famous architect Gaudi. Now, on the right, you have a central command. You have a person who conceived of this and had a team of workers executing this. But the termite hill, which is exquisite, extraordinarily air conditioned and works as one huge organism has no central command. The queen's purpose is entirely reproductive and all the workers, none of them uh, have any uh, comprehension of how this structure comes about and how it functions. Each little unit has competence, but there's no comprehension. Humans are unusual because humans have not only this competence, but they have comprehension. And the analysis of how humans came by on this planet, along with other organisms, uh, was first understood from the theory of evolution by natural selection, from the work of Darwin and Wallace, uh, shown here. And you know, Darwin's trip and Beagle trip in 1835 was very revealing to him. And Wallace's work in Singapore and the Malayan archipelago uh, was absolutely transformative in um, his ideas about evolution. They both had the same idea about evolution, but there was one major difference, uh, which I'll paraphrase. Darwin looked at evolutionary changes across all species with one common origin, and these changes included human. Wallace thought that humans were special and different. Right? And so this is a very important distinction. But nevertheless, both of them were one of the earliest big data scientists who looked at data, looked at data from the outside and came up with a theory of what could be going on inside or what could be happening uh, on these organisms to allow diversity to come about. And basically the point which Darwin made is that all life on this earth has one common origin. And later studies, and those studies are by our understanding of genetics, which came from Mendel uh, and from Thomas St. Morgan and his school shown over here. And then from those who studied uh, the structure, Morgan discovered that uh, you know, genes were on chromosomes uh, along with work done by Muller. But basically the point was, since all life has a common origin, they have a shared chemistry, and that shared chemistry is due to the, um, uh, is linked by this thread of DNA. There's many, many shared chemistries, but DNA is the thread which links them all. And that's shown over here, that's illustrated here in uh, the elucidation of the structure of DNA, work by um, Crick and Watson uh, and Rosalind Franklin, Morris Wilkins and others. Now, the result of those kinds of work, understanding how changes within species come about, i.e. Mendel, and variation and speciation comes about, i.e. Darwin and Wallace, resulted in our attacking another kind of question. How are organisms built? And this shows how the brain of a fly is mapped and this mapping comes from a deep combination of genetics and the creation of tools which allow the labeling of individual cells, serial sectioning by imaging of various kinds, and putting that together to look at both the lineages which give rise to complex structures, here shown in the fly brain, but you can do this now for any organism using a variety of methods. And therefore you can get a very strong description from gene composition to gene expression in every cell to the nature of cellular uh, phenotypes and tissue phenotypes to how the organism looks like. Now this is also of course doable and has been done to greater and greater extents uh, with the human brain. And that now poses a new kind of challenge. Even for the army ant or the termite or the fly, our understanding of gene sequence and its variation, our understanding of a collection of data of gene expression and its variation to build different tissues and 
our phenotyping of behavior has not resulted in a good causal understanding of how, for example, nerve circuits function to give rise to specific kinds of behavior. Indeed, critics will say that even understanding the complexities of behavior in a causal manner of a bacterial cell still eludes us, let alone complex behavior, which insects do or even uh, mammals or humans do. Now, technology illustrated by these examples has greatly changed our access to data. There is, there is a surge of ways by which we can collect data. And what I'd like to have highlight today is this surge in our ability to collect data is resulting in a almost swarm like behavior in terms of our approaches to get data without us paying sufficient under um, um, uh, uh, sufficient attention to the underlying rules of what this data means. This is even further complicated by technologies which are translated into buzzwords, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning, which collect and analyze data sequentially and on training with these data sets, allow prediction of what the next step will be. The allegation against AI and ML is that they merely collect data and tell you what will happen next. But even that allegation is going away because they can also understand and get trained on principles. You can feed them equations, for example, in physics and mathematics, which underlie physical behavior. And therefore, they will use that, compare that with data, see whether you know, the data is consistent, the predictions are consistent with uh, physical laws and go ahead. And you can do that similarly for biological principles. In other words, the ability to understand data is something which increasingly machines will do better and better. And our, our ability to understand data therefore needs to be questioned, where do we fall into that? So technology has dramatically changed this ability to understand data. So the question we need to ask is, if this is the case, how can this help us understand the universe better and apply our understanding better? You know, we can't wish away this you know, onslaught of big data, but what does it mean in terms of our work and what does it mean in terms of understanding? So there's no point in our work collecting data and saying something will happen next. We need to be able to understand that better, expand our knowledge, but also expand possible roads of uh, application. <laughs> so what we need to ask if we need to apply our understanding better is what are the questions we ask of big data today? Now, those questions, relates to where does the data come from? How are we collecting it? What is provenance? What are correlations and what is causal? And for example, you will have find a strong correlation between noodles and Chinese, but it doesn't mean that noodles cause Chinese, right? So we need an understanding of where noodles figure in our collection of big data about let's say Chinese. Now, secondly, Thirdly, how does it help us, how these, the provenance and the, the delineating the link between correlation and causality, how does it help us understand and take actions? So those are the kinds of questions we need to ask. Now, as I said, technology gives us data across scales. And the question we fundamentally need to ask is more better, is getting more and more data better. And what I will try to show is it is valuable, but it's not necessarily better. Secondly, from the nanoscale to the system, there are a huge number of examples of success of big data. So no one is saying that don't collect big data or big data is useless, or it can be uh, replaced by deep thought, not at all. But the question is that are we picking low hanging fruit? You, for example, might do a huge RNA-seq and you find some interesting correlations, and then you find 10 different genes which are of interest. You find three of them are one you can handle, and then you write a paper with one of them. Is this the approach we want to take with big data, or do we want to do something 
conceptually at a new level. And finally, where do we go from here? Now, one of the people who applied their minds best to these kinds of questions was Sidney Brenner. And Brenner, as you all know, was one of the 20th centuries and early 21st centuries greatest biologists. Uh, I won't spend some time on him, but he's worth uh, uh, thinking uh, and reading, not just for his science, but also because of his uh, witticisms. Um, he famously, seeing a graduate student at a Xerox machine, once said, uh, you should be neuroxing and not Xeroxing, uh, and so on. Now, Brenner said that we're thirsting for some theoretical framework with which to understand big data. We have still not managed to do that, uh, particularly in biology, but this is so of, true of cosmology or you know, earth sciences and so on and so forth. Many believe that more is better, he said, but history tells us that least is best. There are people who, you know, like Mendel's contemporaries were looking at you know, sizes of plants and animals and measuring them and looking at dry weight and wet weight. Mendel simplified that by looking at key characteristics which he chose. And Darwin similarly uh, made you know, leaps of judgment which were uh, based not on the volume of data but on their quality. So what Brenner says is that we need theory, some theory, and a firm grasp on the nature of the objects we study to predict the rest. In biology, we pretty much have, you know, at a crude level, the theory of evolution and roughly the central dogma in, with some variations. So data is not enough. It does not speak for understanding. You know, you have data, from that you have to get information, from information you have to get knowledge, from knowledge you have understanding, from that understanding you take decisions. It's a long haul. And there are, you know, as I'll tell you, um, you know, we must, as Brenner says, generating data is very different from this understanding. And to understand, we must get to the core and ask what is the unit of abstraction in each discipline? You know, in astronomy, or for example, what's shown here is two black holes, uh, you know, which were used to look at, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, look at gravity changes, uh, but you can also do, uh, you know, analyze big data in biology in big ways. Now, the conversion of data into knowledge is the biggest challenge we face in our research going ahead. And today, and for a long time, there is a view that we must take what is supposedly called a systems approach, meaning as opposed to, many people will uh, tell us, as opposed to a reductionist approach. Now, this is a false binary. There are a whole lot of biologists who will criticize the reductionist approach and saying that you cannot understand anything about termite behavior or animal behavior or uh, human behavior by looking at uh, the genetics. Uh, and there will be others, uh, cell biologists, who will say that you cannot understand anything without looking at uh, genetics and cell biology. And both are right and both are wrong. So the systems approach came, claims to be able to solve this problem of handling big data. But we must remember that if you have a large amount of data and deducing the fundamental principles which underlie function from that large amount of data is what is called an inverse problem. You have you know, the data and you must now look at the inverse to see what caused that data to come about. The square root of four is two, right? So finding the square root of four is an inverse problem, but the square root of four is also minus two. And as you go on to higher and higher powers and more and more data, there will be a very large number of solutions which fit the data you have. And this is the fundamental problem with big data that you're going to have very large number of solutions which are physically valid, biologically valid, which fit the data you have. And therefore making inferences is a big challenge. <clears throat> so the deduction, deducing models of function from the behavior of a complex system, whether it is a phenotype of cattle or of termites, deducing models of function is an inverse problem that is impossible to solve. 
So you must have a deeper understanding of the biology of the system, your biologists here. So if you have to solve. Now, you cannot escape into holistic approaches in biology. You might be able to do it in other areas because what happens at the molecular level, sometimes even at the submolecular level, has an extraordinary impact on the entire organism and indeed on groups of organisms. The mutation in a coronavirus, which allows it to bind to the human ACE receptor better and transmit is a very minor molecular change. And that can have an enormous impact in the entire world as we have seen, right? And this is the kind of range of impact which constantly from the, bio, from the molecular to the system, which you see in biology. My watching you on the screen requires photons to impact on my eye and then a response coming in. And that again is an example of a direct connection between the molecular and the system and the output, which few other sciences have. So you cannot escape into holistic approaches easily in biology. At the core of biological systems are genes, but genes are not everything you must keep in mind. And since genes are molecules and exert their functions through other molecules, those other molecules are very, very important. The molecular explanation must constitute the understanding of biological systems. So this is a very important statement that a molecular understanding understanding must constitute the core, uh, the molecular explanation must constitute the core of our understanding of biological systems. So that explanation needs to come in every case. You know, is the virus affecting humans in what way? Uh, you know, how does the immune uh, system react? All of that is the core of our explanation of the biology of the organism which we see. Now, we must keep in mind that this molecular exploration cannot be studied or understood by collecting molecules and seeing how many they are and where they're expressed. And one very beautiful example of that is understanding nerve function, uh, the propagation of the action potential, for example. And that explanation for that came from the hodgkin huxley equations. And this is a giant squid whose photograph is shown over here. Now, if instead of doing the physiology, if instead of patching the nerve, the neuron, and looking at voltage and current clamps and deducing uh, an equation which predicted the presence of various kinds of channel, if instead of doing that, Hodgkin and Huxley squeezed out the RNA from a neuron and did the entire RNA seq and translated those RNA sequences and got the set of proteins in that neuron, we would know next to nothing about the physiology of the giant squid neuron. But having figured out the physiology, now, if you look at the big data and the RNA, we can figure out a lot about function, combine that with big data and imaging and so on. So it's a combination of the right level of abstraction and explanation at the molecular level which along with big data can give us the answer. And in this situation, the cell is the right level of um, uh, abstraction. And I'll come to that again. So fundamentally, we must step back a bit and ask as biologists, what are we asking? In a, what are the questions which we ask? And there, Sidney Brenner summarized it beautifully. He said, biologists ask three questions. How does it work? That is physiology or biochemistry. How is it built? That is developmental biology. And how did it get that way? And that's evolution. These are the only three questions that biologists ask. Everything we do falls into that. If you're an engineer and you're not a biologist, by engineers I include medics, then you also ask, how do you fix it when it's broke? Or how do you create new machines, right? Those are two corollary questions which we can ask. But they are subsets of the three principal questions which biologists ask. Now, in answering these three questions, you know, technology has dramatically changed our access to biology. It's not just model organisms which we study now. We can study any organism in a manner similar or closely similar 
to the way we studied model organisms because our ability to access data, look at lineages by following RNA uh, uh, or gene expression profiles or protein profiles, and look at function by a variety of tools in organisms which were earlier not particularly tractable. And phenotyping by looking at imaging in a variety of ways from cellular to organismal behavior have dramatically changed. So technology gives us new access through genetics and genomics, imaging and spectroscopy uh, across scales, no question about that. Uh, and the question, as I said earlier, where do we go from here when we have this kind of access? Now, big data is extraordinarily valuable. And many old time biologists who say that, you know, spectroscopy, I have some deep understanding, that's all rubbish. You need to have big data without any question. Uh, and the biologists who moan its onslaught are just uh, wrong. But we must ask, what is the unit of abstraction in biology? And if we keep that in mind, then we'll be able to link big data from wherever we get, from the outside, from behavior, to that unit of abstraction. And then at the other end, to the sequence, which is very critical, the DNA sequence, because that's what links us to evolution. In this, we have a lot to learn from Alan Turing. Now, Alan Turing died in 1954. He killed himself. And he made enormous contributions uh, in three big areas. Uh, in addition, he contributed hugely to the uh, British war effort against the Nazis. He tried to understand patterns in development in fish and zebras and so on and so forth in shells. He also looked at what's called computing machinery and intelligence. He asked, can you make a computer which is identical to a human. In this screen, how many of us are real people and how many of us are computers? That's the Turing test. That's very important today for uh, AI and machine learning. But relevant to this talk, he also studied computable numbers and what is called the uh, Turing machine. Now, the Turing machine is a machine which is a theoretical machine which allows you to compute anything, right? You have a code and you can put it in and it can, you know, construct new codes and compute anything. It has, in theory, infinite memory and infinite computability. Now, John von Neumann did something to the Turing machine and von Neumann didn't know about genetics at that time. He said, let me try to clone, you know, replicate the Turing machine. And he created a structure, he conceived of a constructor machine, which is capable of assembling another machine according to a description. So there was a description and a constructor looked at the description and made another machine. The constructor looked at the description, made yet another machine, and it also made mistakes. So the constructor looked at the machine, uh, at the description, made a mistake and made a machine which is not identical to the previous one. So there's mutations taking place and these mutations can accumulate and they can clone themselves and go in one direction. So this is very much like, you know, uh, genetics and both variation within an organism and speciation. So von Neumann noted if the copying machine made errors, these mutations would provide inheritable changes in the progeny. And this is from a computational perspective. So this is something which is very important. Now, Going from there, the concept of the gene as a symbolic representation of the organism, a code script, and that is a fundamental feature of the living world and forms the kernel of biological theory. But people misunderstand what this code script means. It is a descriptor, it is not a constructor, right? And that is a fundamental error we do in handling big data in many, many cases. Here is Erwin Schrodinger. Schrodinger is an exile here in Dublin during the Second World War. And he wrote his book, What is Life Over There? And in that book, which inspired many physicists to come to biology, he made a fundamental error. And what is Schrodinger's conflation? 
Now, Turing, Alan Turing invented the stored program computer. And as I said, von Neumann showed that the description is separate from the universal constructor. Now, this is not trivial. Erwin Schrodinger conflated the program and the constructor in his book, What is Life? What Schrodinger said, inspired by what Delbruck and Timofey Vrasovsky did about the nature of the gene, Muller's work on uh, you know, X-rays affecting the gene, and Morgan's work, he studied all of that and said, you know, genes are on chromosome, and chromosomes, i.e., the genome, which we would call today, is the architect's plan and the builder's craft in one. Those of you who have, you know, gone into this crazy spate of building institutional buildings know that that is not right. You cannot give the architect's plan and then expect the building to construct itself. You get the architect's plan done by the architect and then you work with the CPWD or whoever and you know they start interpreting this and constructing this. And you know they can interpret the architect's plan differently one way or the other and the output can be different. So Bart Schrodinger said that the uh, chromosomes have both the architect's plan and the builder's craft in one. Now, this is wrong. The code script contains only a description of the executive function. It is not the executive function. And our fundamental understanding, which we need to have today, is the left hand side of that you know, DNA sequence, the regulatory part, to see how the environment, the cellular environment, the environment of groups of cells, outside environment impact to make the architect's plan <coughs> into the builder's craft. And we constantly conflate this. We constantly look at sequence information by itself being informative. We carry it to different levels. We say RNA sequence is more informative, protein sequences, even uh, protein expression profiles are even more uh, informative and so on and so forth. But we don't, understand that we need to have both an explanation for the architect's plan and the builder's craft. Now, to, for us to be able to understand this, we must choose the right level of abstraction. If we look at genomic sequence or RNA sequence and look at human behavior, then there's an enormous genotype phenotype gap and we will be making all sorts of crazy assumptions linking uh, RNA expression profiles at some stage in a person's life with their behavior and so on and so forth. It will, you know, work 50% of the time. It's sort of like astrology predicting the gender of your, the sex of your child, and that works 50% of the time, right? It's pretty much useless. Uh, and therefore, we need to have a better understanding of the unit of abstraction if we have to understand how big data uh, impacts on studies. And that unit of abstraction, as I said, while talking about the hodgkin axle equation, is the cell. Cells get information from DNA and they change the nature of, uh, of um, gene expression. They get information from other cells. Groups of cells get information from the environment and they affect organismal function. When you look at the army ants, the way the reason they behave differently is not because there's some central processing unit in the brain which tells them to lead or follow or eat or do something. It's sensory information which at the periphery, at their cells, which then go and talk to other cells, which go to talk to other cells. It gives a feeling of a unified theater of command, which is not there, but we can understand that really well by looking at chemical and tactile senses and how they are being processed and how that results in mass movement like you see in the army ants. So to understand the constructive part of the machinery, the cell is the right level of abstraction. Now, what we need to do now is to go from cells to behavior. And this is the biggest challenge we have, yet we also have the tools for that solution. And I'll end with that. Whether we want to look at behavior in human populations or in termite populations, we need to connect not only the biology to our behavior, but also sociology, economics, culture, which are extra biology. And we must be very careful in not lumping those into a biological explanation. 
I illustrated the human brain and one extraordinary distinction, though not a distinction of the kind which Wallace made, but a, one extraordinary distinction is that the brain, unlike the fly brain or the human brain or, or the termite brain, has an ability both for competence as well as comprehension. This ability which the human brain has got because of its size and network abilities for comprehension, in addition to mere competence, allows the city on the right to be made in an extra corporeal, extra human body manner, which is different from what the termite brain does. And that results in our creation of computers, the power of computers, the dominance of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And that is a very non-biological aspect which we have created. We have engineered the planet by trying to understand the planet's engineering. But if you want to understand our biology and the biology of other animals uh, and not our sociology and our culture, we need to use the cell as the basis of abstraction and understand how this shared chemistry in evolution allows organisms to be built and function in the way they do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. It's really a pleasure to uh, listen to such a wonderful talk. And I'm really grateful to you. I can understand the amount of time you have given to make this talk. This is really extraordinary. And as I know, you love science. And I'm thankful for your time to really build this wonderful talk. And uh, we have unmuted everyone. Uh, if you want, you can unmute. And if anybody wants to ask question, few questions, Sari is ready to take. Thank you. Happy to take some questions. Sir, I'm Krishna Ayala, sir. Hi, Krishna. How are you? <laughs> uh, amazing presentation, sir. What less are you words, doing here? Less what are words. you doing here? I thought you'll be vaccinating the planet. No, I'm just listening in this. I, I want to listen passionately. Well, your slide is amazing because with the less number of words, beautiful explanation, number one. Number two, uh, we are all working in isolation. Biologists are working in isolation and they don't understand the value of data. How do we integrate a life science with the computer science and other engineering and life sciences together to for the future uh, ready for the future data point of view? That's my question. Thank you. This is um, um, simple to state, but very difficult to do. Um, and for example, what is needed, I'll give you a Delhi-based example, uh, the NII, the NIPGR, and the ICGEB need to physically and mentally tear down the walls between them and tear down the walls between them and JNU. And JNU needs to tear down the walls between them and IIT. And IIT needs to tear down between them and Ames and the South Campus. Every student anywhere needs to be able to go anywhere else and do any course. So an astronomy student in Bangalore should feel free to do a biology course at, I, at the Indian Institute of Science. At the next level, they should be able to take up common pro projects and not have to go to three different institutional administrations to get their clearance, but one umbrella administration. And at the next level, they should be able to take on big projects of various kinds. Um, we have rightly created disciplines and discipline-based institutions because you require depth to have an understanding of any area. But having created that, our challenge today is to break those disciplinary barriers so that we can actually solve real world problems, both basic and applied. I think there's a mood to do that. And you know, the more we take up those kinds of challenges, uh, the more we will be able to uh, take up more of those challenges. Any more questions? Sir, I, I would like to ask a question, sir. Do you think that uh, we should have institution which should be doing research on advancing the machine learning tool and data analysis? Because when we go, we usually, what I find that Indians, I thought are very kind of sharp in statistics and designing tools, but we just follow whatever others are doing 
and there are institutions with uh, big machines and just generating data and following what others are saying but what you are saying is correct that tomorrow uh, there is a code uh, script which contains the description to execute a function and one architect made it let us call it he created rnas and then we try to do the genotypic phenotypic correlation tomorrow we find that there is another architect who designed some other code which is creating micro rna and our whole philosophy keeps on changing so i think do we have an institution in india where you may be knowledgeable that we are working on honing our skill to do this job as other countries are doing you know this this is a um, thank you subir so this is a problem which is um, also solvable given the extraordinary um, range of talent available in the sites of big investment of science at least and it needs to be expanded to other areas so let me very briefly address both these if you take hyderabad for example you have extraordinary computational abilities in hyderabad in the institutions there and you also have extraordinary biology chemistry drug development institutes and so on and so forth the problem is that intuitively in today's world biologists even in the west in in significant numbers and much more worse situation here are not expert in handling big data in a comfortable manner right uh this is not something which is not learnable just as you know uh 5 or 10 years ago people were not comfortable with handling big data in uh microscopy and imaging they are that there were earlier sets of people who are not comfortable in handling self sorting data now they are this is something which can be learned at a certain basic level that allows you to collaborate with the big engines of big data analysis now from the government's point of view there are as a supercomputing mission there's a ai mission so there's lots of resources available but i find that those are tapped into by computer scientists and engineers and not by biologists even though for example the supercomputing mission was put in place with biology being a major core so we really need to have that push in a big way the challenge is a very simple one um institutions are very tentative about taking on leadership roles and they treat all other institutions as equal partners now that is very valuable in terms of collegiality but you need to have one of them just as you have the um notch pathway selecting one cell and all the others uh, are not you need to have a leadership institution coming up in each of our major centers who performs this integration in bangalore the indian institute of science could do this in delhi uh, iit could do this in hyderabad maybe the central university can do this so you know these are kinds of uh, leadership roles in this kind of integration which needs to be done rajesh is disagreeing with me and he's raised his hand rajesh <laughs> no not at all i was i was in fact asking going to ask you you know how do you do mission programs in biological institutes actually so it's very interesting you know if you look at the 30 meter telescope which is a few thousand crore project or a square kilometer array few thousand crores ligo few thousand crores and you add up the total number of physicists and astronomers in that it will be same as the number of people on the screen right so how do they get it through now you can argue that they they put in programs which are part of international collaborations but biologists haven't done that either okay now there's a no shortage of programs which biologists can put in here which you know can have a enormous impact with say let's say the finance ministry or the government or whatever you call it now these can be a combination of things which are aspirational like space missions you know touch a chord of you know let's all do this or they can be of great practical value there's no sh- shortage of those kinds of things but i think we need to have a group of people who relentlessly push bottom up and take the opportunities which are top down which should also be available physicists all over the world have learned that computer scientists have learned that biologists have done that in some places we need to learn that a lot more manoj you have any question can i can promote? i come in please yeah yeah promote please go ahead yeah 
excellent talk, Dr. Vijay Raghavan. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, so you were talking about breaking the barriers between medical science and, and technical institutes, and you gave an example of AIMS and IIT. Having moved recently from AIMS to now THSTI, um, I think this is an excellent idea. If you look at the medical science, biology is at the core of medical science. Unfortunately, uh, in medical science, we gradually move away from biology because you are supposed to treat only the disease. And if you go up the ladder in the academic circles, then you know you are doing some kind of research, but, but most of the core biology is left out somewhere down the line. And now you talked about big data, which is so very important as you so, so rightly said. The question is, in today's time, if we have to change the medical science and bring in other disciplines, including the big data and engineering, I think we have to have some kind of a university model where medical science and engineering institu institutions and other are housed together. And I think IIT Kharagpur, for example, has taken a lead in setting up a medical school. So what is your thought on having some kind of an integrated um, technical medical universities, uh, which can actually uh, you know, give you much more inputs in this regard. Your thoughts on that. Thank you. Sir, so, so you have to add two points. One, what is happening now, and uh, one which was happened, which happened earlier. Right now, very briefly, you know, I think these examples you gave of Kharagpur, IIT Kanpur also wants to do the same. IISC has plans. These are all good plans. Nothing wrong in that at all. Um, but also keep, look at this year's budget announcements of umbrella uh, centers, uh, you know, in nine cities to be done by this. These umbrella centers are meant to do this, that whether it's IIT Delhi and Ames or other institutions basically provide a structural mechanism by which a professor in one place can be effectively, in spite of all their independent legal structures, effectively also a professor in another place. So it opens up at the bottom level and opens up top down. Now, let me give you an example from the past. Sitting here with us is Pran Talwar. When he was at the biochemistry department at All India Institute, there was him, there was Anand in physiology and a few others in the so-called non-clinical departments who the entire institute used to quiver if they passed by. These were authority figures in the institute. Wonderful. So today, you know, you don't have such non-clinical authority figures in medical institutions. That needs to be restored. And that is an inter-intra-institutional challenge. And you know, you can't have everything fixed top down. So All India Institute must have, you know, respect those who are PhDs as much, as, if not more, than clinicians, because those are the sources of knowledge and links to the entire world. And that kind of a way by which you can get and hire the best computer scientists in the world to become a professor at All India Institute is feasible. You have the legal and other autonomy to do that. But that must you know, come from a bottom-up expressed desire. Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, Prasad, question? Prasad? Hello. Hello, our student. Amit has a question, so you can ask. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Amrit, one question. Amit, so, biology is very non-linear. So, it is very difficult to fit in such non-linear data sets into machine learning and predict biological function. So, how it is, how true will that prediction be when you do such predictions? Well, you know, there are broadly two aspects in such in predictions. One is predictions which have um, utilitarian value. And there, in the large nonlinearity, which you rightly pointed out, you can focus from a utilitarian perspective on ranges which are effectively linear. So, for example, you can say, I'm going to look at certain kinds of pathologies in skin cancer or in interpreting x-rays and so on. So you've narrowed down, you're not looking at the whole range, but you're looking at a small linear component of that range and your predictions uh, become good. But what is happening, which is both 
very interesting and frightening is the increasing ability of big data to perform integrative functions. If you had asked me about five years ago, I would say, well, it's not likely that machines can think about complexities of biology, quote unquote, think about complexities of biology and you need trained biologists for that. But that is changing so rapidly. I mean, we are nowhere near artificial general intelligence, i.e. something which passes the Turing test, but we are getting better and better at various examples of artificial narrow intelligence. Uh, and for example, uh, mimicking a termite hill would be an example of artificial narrow intelligence. Uh, and those kinds of things are becoming capable. So it's quite astounding to see how changes are taking place. Uh, so with this question, uh, we will close the question and answer session. I thank all the, all the people in the audience, very big dignitaries, and really you have responded so well for our invitation. And I feel honored. I could, I could honor. So I am really feel I am feeling honored that all of you have responded well to honor Professor Vijay Raghavan. So it's my pride that I could really uh, ensure that so many big people have joined and interacted with him and attended his talk. So that gives me a satisfaction that uh, although I, I, I was a little uh, apprehensive whether I'll be able to create a, a, a kind of uh, scene where I can really, from bottom of my heart, show that, sir, I have worked hard to ensure that your talk is really, really read, studied, loved by all. It's on YouTube. So I think people, a lot of others have watched. We have circulated it very well. And your labor in making the slides were very much visible. So I thank you very much for your valuable time. And on behalf of Niab and audience, I thank you very much, sir. And I would, uh, somebody will deliver some memento in your office. So please accept that on our behalf. Two things are yet due, sir. One is the dinner with me since you made me director of NIAP and we couldn't set a date. <laughs> and second, the inauguration of our hostel block by you when you come to Hyderabad. So please remember next time you come, give us three minutes. Hope that you will uh, note these two pending issues and oblige us in future. Although we all have become several fold busier than before, but the feeling that you still have some affection for us is and will be a great position for ours uh, in our mind. And thank you very much again, sir. And thanks to audi audience for being with us. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks a lot. So I thank everyone for coming and joining us. Thanks, Indura. Thanks, Manoj. Hello. Kubir. Ah, hello, hello. Yeah, yeah, they will come. They are coming. Okay. Sutra, can you hear me?